have to get wired up. I say to when I'm speaking often that it'll be nice, we won't have to wire up with anything in heaven. <laughs> um, we have been in a series, of course, it's probably hard to follow since I'm here once a month. <laughs> but at any rate, uh, each, each message is a message within itself, but uh, we have been talking uh, about Matthew 24, 14, this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached to every nation and then the end will come. And I believe that's the key event that we need to be looking forward to because that will indicate the end is here and Jesus coming uh, is almost immediate. Uh, I think possibly contemporaneous, although the preaching of the gospel of the kingdom I think will begin before Jesus comes back, but uh, he's getting his body ready. This is, this is what the Lord has emphasized for me in the latter years of my life on this earth. And that is to try to get as many people as possible ready uh, for the preaching. And maybe we should say witnessing, because I think preaching kind of indicates to people that's for preachers. Uh, but witnessing is for everyone. <laughs> so witnessing the gospel of the kingdom. Now, we looked at what it meant to be born again, what it meant to come into the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then we looked at what it meant to be water baptized. And so I begin now, today, this morning, uh, with... Acts chapter 1, uh, because we will be looking at, if we have time today, we'll be looking at Pentecost, at baptism in the Holy Spirit, and how that fits in to not just the individual who can receive baptism in the Holy Spirit, but how that fits into the, the body of Christ, and how Jesus is getting the whole body prepared for the witnessing of the gospel of the kingdom because his, his idea from the beginning is that all Christians, and by the way, the New Testament word saint is not meant for people who the Catholic Church defines as saints, but all people who have come into Christ are saints, holy ones. We don't like that much to think of ourselves as saints because we know that in the sense of, uh, you know, sometimes I think we think a saint never sins or never can sin. Well, it doesn't, it doesn't mean that, but God wants to bring us into the baptism in the Holy Spirit. But I want to try to, to, to uh, teach this morning in regard to what it is and then how that relates to the anointing of the sevenfold spirit and the outpouring of the sevenfold spirit and the getting ready for of the entire body of Christ, the whole body of Christ, so that baptism in the Spirit is not just meant for an individual, although it is an individual experience, but I always tell people if I pray for them, and usually, if I do, we usually are in our meeting, sometimes not, but uh, we usually at least two people there to pray, uh, because uh, the laying on hands is as of the hands of Jesus because he's the baptizer. But we are baptized not only individually, but we are baptized into a body of spirit-filled believers. And the body of spirit-filled believers is the key to the carrying out of uh, the preaching or the witnessing of the gospel of the kingdom. So we'll start to tie some of these things together. Acts 1 verse 4 Acts 1 verse 4 and gathering them together he brought them together he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem but to wait tarry wait sometimes we Christians have a problem waiting they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength mount up with wings as eagles and run and not be weary and walk and not faint Wait is a Hebrew word means come from a word which 
means to braid together like hair is braided together. We are we become braided together in prayer, uh, in, in uniting with Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They that wait upon the Lord, which he said you heard from me, for John baptized with water. Now we were looking last time at the water baptism. And the water baptism is a symbol of a, a public declaration. The Christians of the Jesus' day in the New Testament church, looked. Uh, they usually had a public ceremony proclaiming, their baptism is proclaiming their death. And they are no longer in the flesh. They are, but I mean, God sees you as in the spirit. And so you should think of yourself as in the spirit and not controlled any longer by the flesh. To die to the flesh is to die to sin. And we need to die daily. Uh, it isn't something that we can do one time and not. Paul says, I die daily. So I must constantly remember uh, that God sees me as dead to sin but alive to Christ. Holiness is mainly not receiving something, but dying to the ability to sin, so that I consider myself dead to it. And so water baptism, going under the water, is symbol. So, and John baptized with water, but uh, you should be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Now he's speaking to the disciples who were Christians. Disciples are Christians. But he said, you need to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. I remember when I first was born again. It was a quite a, a dramatic experience for me. I was 31 years old in a Methodist church walking down the aisle one Sunday evening in Grove City, Pennsylvania. And uh, had my life transformed. I was in the church, attending the church. I believed in the right things. I believed in God. I believed in Jesus. I believed that he died. I believed that he rose from the grave. But to believe those things is good, but not sufficient to bring you into the kingdom. You must receive the life of Christ. You must receive his life so that you die to your life and receive his life, which is a resurrection life. And so he wants you to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Now, I'm going, to, I'm going to read the rest of this down to verse 8. Then I'm going to go to Luke 4.18 to try to tie in uh, what Jesus said there with what he's saying here. Uh, what he said in Luke 4.18, I'll read in a few minutes. But to carry that out, you have to, you have to receive these words here. You can't do what he wants you to do in Luke 4.18 without receiving what he's speaking about here in chapter 1 of the book of Acts. And when, so when they had come together, they were asking him, saying, Lord, is it at this time that you are restoring the kingdom to Israel? Because they didn't understand, the disciples didn't understand how Jesus was going to restore the kingdom. And they, 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 they didn't understand what Jesus told them. Well, when Peter when Jesus told Peter that he was going to die, uh, Peter said, No, Lord, you won't die. And Jesus had to say, Satan, get thee behind me. Because he did have to die. That was necessary to defeat sin and to defeat death and to defeat what Satan was trying to bring into the world because Satan, uh, he had rebelled against God, but John 12, 31 says that he was the ruler, Satan, of this world or this cosmos. The Greek word is cosmos. Uh, our, our English word world is not a good translation because we don't have an English word that means what the Greek word means. Uh, because the Greek word cosmos means a system and an order of things led by Satan who leads a rebellion against the word of God, against Jesus who is the word become flesh. And so there is, I'm fond of saying Satan is not an atheist, but a rebellion, in rebellion against God. He knows, he knows that God exists, but 
Uh, James says, you believe that God is one, you do well. The demons believe and tremble. The demons are not atheists. That, that makes some intellectuals really bright, doesn't it? Because <laughs> it's usually only intellectuals who think they are uh, atheists. Of course, Paul says when you look at the world and the creation, you know there's a God. So an atheist is lying to himself. An atheist is lying to himself. You know, all you have to do is look at the world and you know there's a God. He said to them, Is it not for you to know the times and the epochs which the Father has fixed on his own authority? Jesus fixes, God the Father fixes, the Holy Spirit fixes everything eternally. His eternal laws are fixed. His eternal moral laws are fixed. This modern world doesn't know anything about what is fixed. But all law, the word itself, means something fixed. So if you speak of evolving law, you are not speaking of law. You are speaking of man's rebellion. Because man rebels against God's law, and then he, de- he declares, man declares, what law is, it's not law. God's canceled it already before men ever speak it. But men still foolishly speak their own will. And your own will, my own will, uh, is always temporary. And it brings us into bondage. The only way we can be free is to surrender our will to the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit and always do the will of the Father. I mean, the key, the key to not sinning is to exercise our will to follow God's will. And we all have that ability to exercise our will. It is not for you not all the times of the epics which the Father is fixed, but you shall receive power dynamis English word dynamite comes but dynamite is even a poor word because the power when God the Father spoke and out of nothing ex nihilo not out of evolution out of nothing water the earth the mountains the seas the plants, the animals, and finally man himself made in the image of God because God took the dust of the ground and breathed the Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit hit the dust, man became a living soul. Your will, your mind, your emotion, your personhood. That's why you are Trinity. You are spirit, you are soul, you are body. In the Western world, we often don't make a distinction between the spirit and the soul. That's because of Western education. If you go to the, to the Mideast or the East, none of those people have problem with the reality of spiritual things. It's Americans and British and uh, Western people with Western education uh, trying to promote education as if there is no realm of the spirit. And a kind of a shadow, shadowy meaning, I'm not sure we, that most people, when people talk about a soul, I'm not sure most people know what they, what they are talking about. Uh, and uh, I know I didn't, I didn't know anything about this uh, until I read Jessie Penn Lewis. She wrote in the 1860s, a British woman, got filled with spirit. And first place, the first time I ever read anything. And she explained the difference between the realm of the spirit and the realm of the soul. And it's been very, very, very important. To understand the baptism of the spirit, you need to understand that, that, that we have a spirit. Yes, the Holy Spirit. But out of the Holy Spirit comes our spirit. That's the essence of who we are. Our soul is, is not the essence of who we are. 
our spirit, our spirit man, our spirit woman, is the essence of who we are. And so God wants to, well, he, listen, let's read this, verse 8. You used to receive power. By the way, the power you receive is not to make you powerful. The baptism of the Holy Spirit does not make you powerful. It makes you a pure channel of His power. You must remember always, always, always that any power that comes through you is attached to Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And if you are ever broken in that attachment in your spirit, man, with your mind, will, and emotions, if you're ever detached from the Spirit of God, then there is no power. Well, there could be a demonic power. A demonic power is supernatural. Uh, but uh, that's, that's what happened, I think, in Matthew 7. When they did these things, and Jesus said, I never knew you. Because they were not, they were, I think, working soulishly. Because people, people who are into the supernatural and into dark supernatural things can perform miracles. Uh, I, I remember in the Monday night Bible study, you may remember this, Jim, uh, listening to, to Doreen Irving from England. And I, it was the first time I'd ever heard a witch uh, testify how she had been saved. Now she got delivered from demon power. It was in the church downtown. I think we were meeting for a while in a Presbyterian church, was it? It was a down, a downtown. It was along Broadway, I think. Uh, and uh, she spoke for over two hours. It seemed like 15 minutes. And by the way, that, when I heard her say that all the witches got a, a big kick and thought it was a great joke that Christians celebrated Halloween. She said, that's our holiday. That's our devil's holiday. That's a holiday for death. That's a holiday for, to, to celebrate the, the spirits of death. And, uh, well, you better believe we stopped uh, suddenly celebrating Halloween at our house. But you must be baptized to receive power. The Holy Spirit will come upon you. And you shall be witnesses. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. If you have an anointing of the Holy Spirit of God, if you've been baptized in the Spirit with the purpose of expanding that into a corporate anointing, because God wants to bring you into an individual anointing, but then to bring you into a corporate anointing. We in, the, in America, the American church has emphasized the individual, and it is, the individual is the first key, but the individual is not the end, end goal of God. The individual is to bring all individuals to become one in Christ so that the power is that much greater. And the anointing is that much greater. When you can get all the church anoint, anointed and united, we haven't seen that yet, but it's coming. And, and then there will be a release of power as never, ever before. Now, let me connect this to Luke 4.18. And then I'll go back to Acts chapter 1. Jesus was handed the prophet Isaiah and he opened the book and he said the Holy Spirit is upon me. Is the Holy Spirit upon you? See, the language of being baptized in the Spirit some places it says that they were baptized in the Spirit. Some places they were filled with the Spirit. Some places the Holy Spirit came upon them. The Holy Spirit came within them. That's all the same experience. We don't have to, to use... The only reason I usually use baptism in the Spirit is because Jesus said, John baptized with water, but we just read it, but you should be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. 
So what, what is the more ultimate purpose of, if we're going to preach or witness the gospel of the kingdom, what is the gospel of the kingdom? Well, I believe Jesus defines it. He says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has anointed me to witness the gospel to the poor. Get it in witness and then we don't think of having to be a preacher. Because God did not mean this to be an anointing that comes on someone who is ordained by a church. I mean, people ordain, bishops in different denominations ordain people, they may not even be born again. Because, because the Methodist Church or the Presbyterian Church or the Baptist Church or the Catholic Church or whatever church it is, because these leaders it, it, uh, uh, ordain people, it doesn't mean that they have a calling that comes from God. I mean, if you are not called by God, you have no business preaching. Amen. You need to be called by God to witness. And all people who have been saved and baptized in the Spirit, Jesus wants you to know that you have been anointed by the Holy Spirit, by Jesus, who is the one who is the only one who can, can uh, really, he's the one who lays on hands. We lay on hands as a symbol of Jesus' hands, and Jesus is the one who anoints. Now, so we can witness. Acts 1.8 we read it. You shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses, martyrs. I didn't know that. So what it meant when I received the baptizing power of the Holy Spirit. Uh, Pastor Wormbrand used to say, I met him and, and had him, uh, he spoke at Asbury in the 1970s. I guess he died 10 years or so ago. He and Sabina were Romanian Jews and then converted, became Messianic uh, Jews, became Christians and imprisoned by the communists for 13 years and, and uh, one of the greatest Christians I've ever met. But, uh, you know, the God, the anointing uh, was on Richard Wormbrand. Uh, and we supported, well, used to call it Jesus of the Communist World, now it's the voice of the martyrs. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, we were to preach or witness, and he said something like this, that we don't really believe, we're not really believers, unless we're ready to die. unless we're ready to give our lives. And so witnessing is you speak, a witness speaks the truth, even if it costs his life. I think I've, I've told you, in China in 05 and 06, and even in Vietnam, I've run into many, many believers uh, who in 06 in China, when we were almost arrested, they asked me, and, and, and should we leave? The, the, police were, the police were surveilling. They knew the police were surveilling. And uh, I said, I don't know, but let's ask the Lord. And so we prayed, and the Lord said to me clearly, I want you to, I want you to, to stop the meeting. And we did. And uh, they asked, I was the oldest one there. It's one advantage of going to the Far East. Uh, age is respected uh, and uh, so uh, when I said the Lord said we should break up the meeting they broke up the meeting I think if there had been a vote that we would have remained because most, of, almost all the pastors their attitude was if we're arrested we're arrested but we must hear the gospel we must hear the gospel and so, uh, 
he has anointed us to witness the gospel of the kingdom to the poor. And the gospel of the kingdom always, don't have time to go to Luke and other portions in Matthew, but the gospel of the kingdom always involves the release as people speak and witness. You witness, you witness, you will witness. I mean, Acts 1 8, you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has gone upon you. And you shall be witnesses. Not maybe, you shall be witnesses. Because if you have experienced, if you have experienced not an idea out of the Bible, as wonderful as the ideas are, you can be filled with ideas and have notebooks filled with the ideas and the words of the Bible, but if they don't get into you and into your spirit, where you speak and act, you don't even know Christ. You can know a lot about Christ and about God. Christianity is not no, is, has, has little to do with knowing about Christ or about God. But knowing God and experiencing His life. And this, this experiencing of His life is the key to the release of power. And so... Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons, freely be received, freely give. That's in Matthew 8. I've, I think I've told you before. That changed my life. Because the Lord, for the first time many, many years ago, 35, 40 years ago, I can't remember how long, uh, the Lord spoke to me and, uh, and said, this is for you. Well, I thought that was for Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And for me, for me, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons. I'd done none of those things. I'd not seen anyone do any of those things. <laughs> now, among that list, I haven't seen the dead raised, but uh, I know he's doing it. I've been reading Heidi Baker's book. Compelled by love. If you haven't read it, read it. Uh, because they're in Mozambique. They are seeing uh, dozens of the dead raised. Sending teams of little children who pray for the sick and they're healed. Who pray for the dead and they're raised. Teams of little Mozambican children who have nothing who eat on garbage dumps, many of them. Now, so it is, and then, to heal a broken hearted. This, this, this is, all these things are a part of what the baptism of the Holy Spirit is supposed to produce, so that you enter into, as a connected to the power because you don't have any power to do these things. I don't have any power to do these things. But God has all power. And he loves us so much uh, that, that he, he releases his love and his power and lets it flow through us. How can it be? I'm still amazed. I'm still amazed. Whenever God does some miracle, and I have been a vehicle, he's, been, he's always the one who does the healing or the deliverance. But heal the brokenhearted. The, to heal, the heart is a symbol for the spirit of man. Uh, the, the emotional. We, we are an emotionally broken people. We, we are a, a... The world is full of people who are broken hearted. And he wants us to pray for the broken hearted. I remember when I had cancer. I... I... I uh, uh, got to Proverbs 18.14. If the spirit of a man, that's a part of his heart, if the spirit of a man is not broken, he can bear any illness. If a spirit of a man or woman is not broken, he can bear any illness. We cannot, we must, we must heal the broken hearted because that's a key to their physical health, a key to their mental health. And there's so many who are broken hearted. So many. The children. Our children. Our children are sitting, many of them, on a ton of anger. 
Because children that are undisciplined are angry. They don't know the reason. And we we have teaching that that uh, what Proverbs says about discipline uh, is outdated. Well, God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And America, of all nations, is bearing fruit of a totally undisciplined younger generation. Now we can't, now you have to go back, you used to go back to the grandmothers and the grandfathers. Now it's getting to where the, that, that, that generation is under, we've had so many generations of, of lack of discipline that it's hard to go back far enough to where people were raised with discipline. And the, the scripture says if we, if we don't discipline our children, we don't love them because God disciplines us as his children. If he loves us, he disciplines us so that we will come under the anointing. So it's, it's, it's to witness, witness to what we know that we know. We've experienced healing. I witnessed the divine healing. I was divinely healed. I witnessed to be born again. I was born again. I witnessed to be baptized in the Spirit. I was baptized in the Spirit. I witnessed to, to whatever I witnessed to. I've experienced. I know. Excuse me. <laughs> I know. I know. The Bible says, when you know, you shall witness. And this is meant for all the body. These things are meant for all the people, but for to bring the people together. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives. And the Greek word here is the same word that means people totally imprisoned. With bars, like bars, uh, like, a, like a prison cell. Totally imprisoned. Imprisoned by who? Satan. So that this is the, this is what I call demonization. Uh, sometimes it's been ref- referred to as uh, being controlled uh, 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 by Satan uh, uh, or possessed. Uh, King James uh, or, uh, ordered, King James was uh, a king at the time of the King James Bible, and he ordered that the word possession be used to translate a, a Greek word which does not necessarily mean what the English word possess means because I don't believe Satan ever totally possesses anyone but he can come and if, 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 if he comes into you or demon powers come into you or demon powers come into you and begin to control you then you are demonized and you were in prison. You were in Satan's prison. And you will never be free unless you understand your, your authority. You have authority over serpents and scorpions, over all the power of the enemy. You, you know what, what binding and loosing means. What we bind on the earth, so are we bound in heaven. What are we loose on the earth, so are we loosed in heaven. We understand these things. And so we take authority in Jesus' name. And, and God wants us to take authority in his name. And recovery of sight to the blind. And so pray for the sick. And God will... I mean, the, the teams that Heidi Baker has sent out of children in Mozambique, they go into villages. They pray for the sick in a village. And most of the sick are healed. And the rest of the village comes to Christ. They pray for the people who are, have died, and many of them come uh, uh, back to life, and the village comes to Christ. <laughs> she said, uh, faith is, is, is preaching the gospel is, is simple. Just pray for people to be raised from the dead. Just pray for the sick. They prayed, she said they prayed for one village, they pray for blind people, and so well, most of the blind people are healed, and uh, the others come to Christ. But they pray for the deaf, and most of the deaf are healed, and, uh, and most of the village comes to Christ. 
See, this, 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 people, the salvation of Jesus Christ is complete and total. And it is all one. To be spiritually born again, to be baptized in the Spirit, to be healed, to be delivered from this kind of power, then to be delivered from, to set free those who are oppressed. This is another type of deliverance. To set free the oppressed, the ones who are pushed down and controlled by Satan through their mind. They may not have any demons in them. I pray for a lot more people who are oppressed mentally. Their mind is controlled. The mind is controlled, you know, one of the most common things that, that people get under in their mind is a spirit of rejection. We have a whole generation that's been rejected. That often brings anger and bitterness and resentment. And they're, 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 they're filled with anger and bitterness and resentment. And we use drugs of all things. Drugs of all things. To ameliorate these conditions, they may ameliorate one thing and cause t t ten other things. I don't know what's wrong with us. Well, I do. <laughs> we don't believe Jesus. We don't believe the Word. We don't believe he'll do what he says he will do. We run in fear uh, to the doctor. I'm not against going to doctors, medicine at all. But we ought to go there understanding that God, who is Yahweh Rapha, and that's his nature to heal. There's no Hebrew word named for God, the Lord our disease giver. Only the Lord Rapha, the Lord our healer. And so, if medicine is used, it's only because God, the Father, is used. I mean, there are no sick people in heaven. I don't think any Christian believes that of any stripe. But I often remind people who don't believe in praying for the sick now, and who don't believe in divine healing, uh, Jesus told us in the Lord's Prayer to pray thy will be done in heaven as it is on the earth. So if everyone is healed in heaven, what am I supposed to do? While I'm, uh, how should I pray here on the earth? Well, if it's your will, Lord, that isn't what God says. Pray the will of God. The will of God is they be healed. I know you won't see in 100% of the times people healed immediately. But I'll say, I'll, gu I'll guarantee you this, if you don't obey that, you'll never see anyone. <laughs> and God wants you to pray. Now, these are the things that he told us so that being baptized in the Spirit. Now, I'll go back to Acts 1. I'm not going to get as far as I thought I would, but that's all right. We'll get through this eventually. <laughs> if Jim keeps inviting me back. Uh, so, uh, let's go back to Acts 1. So, we see Jesus has said that John baptized with water. You should be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Uh, you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses. And that's witnesses. Everyone witnesses. And witnesses, witness to the things they've experienced. They've seen and heard and handled in First John chapter 1. What you've seen and heard and handled. I'm handling this Bible, but I handled healing from cancer too. 33 years or so ago. I handled it. Everything, everything, what he speaks will become sight. Now some of it won't become sight until we see him and become as he is. Because that's when our salvation is complete. So our, our salvation isn't complete yet. We're in the kingdom. We'll make it to heaven. 
if, if, if Jesus has come within you, you'll make it to heaven. But he wants us to be baptized in the Spirit. Now, I want to look more as, as we have time. Uh, what does this... What does this mean and what does this mean for the future uh, of the church and what's going to happen? I'm getting warm. I think I'm going to put this off. <laughs> it's a heavy wool jacket. and So, turn with me to Acts 2, verse 1. All of this is preparation for us as individuals, then as the whole body brought together, for the witnessing of the gospel of the kingdom. So, uh, this is, no matter your age, no matter your age, uh, we've got to get out of the American thinking about age. I realize that you can't get away from the consequences uh, of aging. There's no way to get away from the consequences of aging. But I do know this, uh, that when the anointing comes, I remember when I had cancer, and I would go up to preach the word, and I, I would have been weak, and I would, 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 didn't know that whether I could get through, and then the anointing would come, and then it was as if I was 15 years old. And when the anointing comes now, I mean, there is a renewed strength. There is a, I mean, the Holy Spirit. It, it, not to make me live to a hundred or, or some age. I don't, I, it doesn't make any difference how, how many years I live. Uh, it, 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 it is that I use those years for the full anointing right up to the time when he calls me. And when he calls me, I'm going to happily answer yes Lord I'm coming as if I could do anything else <laughs> and when the day of Pentecost had fully come they were all together in one place unity unity the Holy Spirit is meant to bring unity listen one of the greatest lies of Satan is that when you get baptized in the Spirit, begin to move in the supernatural gifts of the Holy Spirit, that this divides the church. That's blasphemous lie. Because, word of knowledge, word of wisdom, word of prophecy, tongues, interpretation of tongues, miracles, healings, discerning of spirits, these are all meant to, to set people free, 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 and to bring people into a unity and a harmony. It's the attitude about these things that divide. It's the attitude about these things. It's the refusal to believe that whatever the scripture says, well, I've never seen it. Well, do you think you've seen everything God has ever done? I never saw in my local Methodist church that I grew up in in Claypool, Indiana. I never saw anyone healed, anyone delivered, anyone. I never saw anything supernatural. We knew what was going to happen by the bulletin. And I'm not. I'm not trying to. I'm not. I'm not trying to. I'm not trying to make fun. I. I. I you know, that my my parents grew up, and that's all they knew. And I believe they knew Christ, but they never had anyone preach to them, to teach them. I, they didn't know how to study the scripture. And, and so, I, I mean, I'm not trying to, I don't want to mock. I, I'm not, I hope you don't interpret what I said as mocking. It's just that, uh, and God can use to a degree, but he can't use fully all that he wants to do. We, we just don't understand how much God wants to do in us and through us. It's a miracle to me, and I praise you, Lord. I thank you, Lord, that, that God wants to use me, and he wants to use you when he could accomplish it all himself. That miraculously, he could accomplish. He can do anything. The Lord showed me when I early, when I began to teach the Bible. The Lord showed me 
When I teach you a truth from the Bible, the Lord would say to me, Remember, I'm above that. I'm sovereign. I can intervene when I want to intervene. I can intervene on a blasphemer and heal him and bring him into my kingdom. I mean, he kind of he kind of treated Paul pretty roughly, knocked him down. <laughs> Uh, because God wants to use us. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all together. By the way, fully come mean, means that it happened at exactly the right moment. Do you, ever, do, you ever, do you realize that what happens, what God brings on the earth, happens at the exact second, at exact millisecond of when... He has determined it will happen. And I, I remember, I've told you this, but I'll tell you again because it's good. <laughs> the, the, the word Pentecost comes from the word penta, which means 50th. And I never knew until I read Messianic Jewish literature that the Jews thought the first Pentecost was when the Ten Commandments were given. When were the Ten Commandments forgiven? On the 50th day, after they came through the Red Sea. On the 47th day, they were in a, around the mountain. And then they blew the trumpets, and then suddenly silence. The mountain shook, fire, lightning, thunder. They all thought they were going to die, because God was about to speak directly to them. They thought they would die if God spoke directly to them. And he did. And he spoke the word. The eternal moral law. And he wrote it. In the sands of time. He wrote it into eternity. Wrote it on tablets of stone. And he'll write it on the tablets of our heart. If we're baptized in the Holy Spirit. That's how our, that's how our hearts are purified by the Holy Spirit. He will write the law of love. That the Holy Spirit wrote on the tablets of stone. He will write that law of love in our heart. So that perfect love. Galatians 5.22 breaks it into nine parts. Love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, gentleness, meekness, faithfulness. Self-control. Self-control. That's the key. We can't control the self-life, but the Holy Spirit can control the self-life. Do you know that every one of our founders... I'm trying to think about Jefferson. Almost all of our founders understood that if you didn't have the moral law of love written in your heart... You could never have political freedom, economic freedom, or spiritual freedom. And that all freedom was based on spiritual freedom. And Jesus, when he wrote the law of love in your heart, so that his love would shine, and by faith, whatever man, whatever man did to you, whatever happened to you, however you were mistreated, however when men shall revile you and, and, and uh, speak against you, say all manner of evil against you falsely, rejoice! Leap for joy, Luke says. Leap for joy, for so persecuted they the prophets who were before you. I mean, this kind of this kind of power cannot be stopped by Satan, because the more they persecuted, the more they praise, and the more they praise, the more power is released, and more people are saved, more people are healed and delivered and saved, and it's coming. I'm not going to get as far as I thought today, but. It's coming. It's coming. There is coming a great outpouring of the Holy Spirit of God. And by the way, don't let me forget, that on the 50th day, after Jesus was raised from the grave, Pentecost, Acts chapter 2 occurred. On the 50th day, after Jesus was raised from the grave, I remember when I read that in Messianic Jewish literature, I said to myself, why did no preacher, I never heard a preacher tell me this. No preacher knows this. On the 50th day, after Jesus was raised from the grave, I mean, he is, he is 
in every millisecond. Of course, actually, God doesn't deal with seconds and minutes uh, uh, and hours and days and weeks and months and years because a day is a thousand years. Eternity has no eternity has no time. God's mind is the eternal now. A thousand years ago is now. Today is now. A thousand years into the future is now. Hebrews talks about now. Believe it now. Because now is an eternal now. We need One of the reasons we don't walk in faith is we are tied as human beings to days and months and years. If something doesn't happen the next day after we prayed, if something doesn't happen the next week, if something doesn't happen the next month, if something doesn't happen the next year, of course most people have already fallen away and said, well, God didn't want to do that. How do you know? Every promise is eternally. Abraham's still receiving. He's still receiving descendants. (laughs) And so many things happen. Remember, remember, everything in faith is based on eternity. It's based on eternity. It has nothing to do with time. And we limit ourselves when we live according to time. God doesn't want us to live according to time. And there's a, there's a sense in all of us, especially a lot of us are in this class are, are, are getting up there in age. And, and, and the older you get, the more you realize, uh, man, this year is, is almost over. And... Uh, of course, I, I, I noticed that when I was young, but when you're young, I don't think you think too much about it. But then when, when you get my age, you begin to think, well, well wait a minute here. Uh, <laughs> but, but see, we must not let that, we must not let that inter, inter, interfere. Uh, we must have the leadership of the Holy Spirit of God. Verse 2, And suddenly there came from heaven a noise, like a violent rushing wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And this is the empowerment, the wind of the Spirit. The wind of the Spirit comes. I've often thought, rather than ask people, have you been baptized in the Spirit, have you been overwhelmed with the Spirit? Have you ever been overwhelmed with the Spirit? I believe God. Uh, wants us to be overwhelmed with the Spirit. Some people seem to be able to receive more than others when they're baptized in the Spirit. I don't understand that, but I mean it, 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 it happens. More pe- people can, can receive more. Uh, and uh, no two people that I've ever prayed for receive the same amount of no- anointing. But I guess that's really like God. I mean, uh, it's not that He... It's not that he, I don't think he's thinking, well, I'm going to favor this one over this one. I don't think he thinks that way. I think he, he, knows, he knows who we are. He knows how, we, how we've been created. He knows what he has put us here on the earth for. And he knows the anointing we need to accomplish what he's put us here for. Does that make sense? And so therefore, uh, some people receive a greater anointing. And the greater anointing we receive, the more responsibility we have. Uh, to obey, 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 obey. Nothing, nothing we need do but obey. Because God accomplishes everything. We can't accomplish anything. And there appeared to them tongues of fire, distributing themselves as they rested on each one of them. Fire purifies. Fire purifies. The scripture says we'll baptize, uh, the Holy Spirit will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Or Jesus will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. And the fire is a purifying work. Acts 15.9 says they had their hearts purified by faith. Same group, Acts 10, who were baptized in the Spirit, spoke in tongues, also had their hearts purified by faith. And I, I, in the holiness movement at, at, at Asbury, they used to teach 
that uh, that there is God puts well takes something out of you so that you can't sin I think this is not correct biblical teaching I think it's what he puts in you not what he takes out of you uh, I don't think anyone when they're baptized in the spirit and some people call uh, to be entirely sanctified uh, I don't think anyone ever is all ability to sin is taken out of them I think there is always an ability to sin as long as we have a will a, a, a mind and emotions as long as we have our personhood there is an ability to sin uh, but God wants to write the law of love in our hearts this is what he does he writes the law of love in our hearts like I said earlier the Holy Spirit came and wrote the, the Ten Commandments on tablets of stone and the prophet said I'm going to write that on your heart and so perfect love is written in your heart and there it is what are you going to do with it what are you going to do with this perfect love that he's written in your heart never forget don't, don't let a day go by don't let an hour go by that you forget his perfect love if you've been baptized in the spirit his perfect love is written in your heart and if you are tempted to anger or bitterness or resentment or, or depression or, or whatever you, you resist that firm in your faith uh, because it's a condition of the mind by the way all bondage is based on lie is based on lie there's not a bondage there's not a mental bondage that people have that isn't based on lie people who are, are under, uh, under a rejection God doesn't reject you but because of what happens to people they think they are rejected because people have rejected them their father or mother have rejected them that's the worst but, but whatever anger, bitterness, resentment, whatever that, that, that's based on lie uh, and the truth will set you free the truth will set you free hallelujah praise God and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and they began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit was getting the utterance now there's been a lot of I don't want to I, I, I'm not going to comment on this too much just a just, just very brief statement there's been a lot of uh, argument and some denominations spirit filled denominations say that speaking in tongues is the only evidence uh, for being baptized in the Holy Spirit and uh, all I can tell you is uh, my own experience and then what the Lord spoke to me and uh, this is not what the Lord spoke to me is not a standard for you but I want to share what, what the Lord said uh, I had been saved and I knew I was saved and I was, I, was, I was different I was a different man suddenly I was a different man and uh, a guy at a, a Grove City United Methodist Church in, in, in Grove City, Pennsylvania witnessed to me that I needed to be baptized in the spirit to speak in tongues and so I was interested so I listened and I read and uh, so I thought yes I, I want this and so I began to pray uh, and uh, the Lord uh, uh, I said Lord uh, do I have to speak in tongues before I can be baptized in the Holy Spirit uh, he said no you just have to believe me that I will baptize you in the Holy Spirit there is no experience that's a substitute for faith in being baptized in the Spirit and that I will do it you must believe you must believe now I do believe this that once you come into it didn't take me two weeks to speak in tongues but once you come into an experience and by faith receive the baptizing power of the Holy Spirit the Lord will immediately move in you and I think one of the reasons he brings people 
it, it, it's, it's something you get to do. It's not something you have to do. <laughs> That's why I always was uncomfortable in because sometimes in full gospel circles they would get around people and then they would just they would concentrate on tongues, 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 and they would say, "Well, just speak this or speak that, anything to get them to speak something that sounded like tongues." And the Lord would never let me pray for people that way uh, to tell them to speak something. Well, you can tell them to speak something, but you don't say. Uh, well, say Abadaba, or say, uh, uh, because, see, you don't, you don't want to get a, a fleshly element into speaking in tongues. It needs to be of the Spirit. It needs to be of the Spirit. And so, uh, I remember questioning. I, I was... I was praising the Lord, and uh, hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. And I thought, wait a minute. <laughs> Maybe that's me. I don't want anything that's not God. So I stopped. And then it happened to me again the same way. And then I came to a full gospel businessmen's meeting in, in uh, uh, Youngstown, Ohio. And uh, we were able to... Uh, I was trying to. I'm trying to think of the man. Some of you would know him. He's died now, but uh, uh, anyway, uh, he. We prayed, and and I got really assured, knowing that when I was trying to praise the Lord, and I think the two most important things in 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 speaking in tongues, the two most important purposes is to praise the Lord freely. And to pray for people's needs when you don't know them. And so, every day when I pray, if I pray for you, any of you, I pray in spirit. Because that's one of the things that God wants to do. Now, let me, let me just kind of, uh, well let me read Acts 2.17. Usually I, I, I conclude at 10.15, so I hope that's all right. Okay. Um, Acts 2.17. And it shall be in the last days, God says, I will pour out forth my spirit upon all mankind. Now, that's the Joel prophecy. Was the Joel prophecy fulfilled in Acts 2? No. Because not every nation, not people all around the world, that's coming. That's coming. There is a reign, and there is a double reign in Deuteronomy. There is a reign of the Spirit, first Pentecost, then there is coming a double reign of the Spirit, where next time I will be teaching in regard to the double reign. In other words, the great, great outpouring of the Spirit that leads into the coming of Jesus and leads into the preaching of the gospel of the kingdom where all people, all the church is finally united and empowered. So... The Spirit, I will pour forth my Spirit upon all mankind. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your young men shall see visions, your old men shall dream dreams. And upon my bond slave, both men and women, I will in those days pour forth my Spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will grant wonders in the sky above. And signs on the earth beneath, blood, fire, vapor, smoke, sun shall be turned into darkness, moon into blood before the great and glorious day of the Lord's coming. And it shall be that everyone who calls on his name, the name of the Lord, shall be saved. So there is coming a greater outpouring of the Holy Spirit of God. Now, the last thing for today, we went over these once before. So I will just kind of list them uh, with, with uh, very minimal comment. What happened in the, in the New Testament church, uh, they, they received the anointing of the Holy Spirit 
they receive the anointing in the way that Jesus will bring it for all Christians in the end days. So the New Testament church received a greater anointing because there was a corporate aspect in the New Testament. There were not just individuals, the apostles, not just individuals who were baptized in the Spirit, but the body of Christ. This is what's going to happen again. But when the New Testament church was, was, was persecuted, that's why they grew so rapidly because they were, they were moving in the full anointing of the sevenfold spirit of God. And so here is a list for today to close. These were the characteristics of the New Testament church who had been people who had been baptized in the spirit. But these characteristics are about the whole church. The whole church as one, as if they were one. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the Word of God. They were all reading the Word of God. Do all people read and study the Word of God today? Has, has there been a, it's a church age since the New Testament? I don't know of any church age since the New Testament where the whole church was reading and studying the Word of God and acting, not just hearing someone speak about it, but they were reading it so that they could obey it. Read, obey, read, obey, read, obey. That'll bring people together. We all become radicals. <laughs> I mean, when you, when you do this today, you're going to be looked on as some radical nut. <laughs> but we all will become. Then, the, uh, uh, to fellowship, and that means koinonia, uh, uh, Oneness. The whole body one becomes one. I know Christ. I know uh, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Yeah, Jim, if you've received Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you're one with Him. And I've received the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one with Him. Then I'm one with you, and you're one with me. And they had this kind of unity. And breaking of bread together. And to prayer. Prayer with power. Prayer with power is agreed prayer. The whole body agrees. The whole body agrees. There's not one person's got, got someone in cancer in a church today. Some people got them dead. Some people got them healed. Everyone kept feeling a sense of awe. Wonder. Signs and wonders. I don't have time to continue with this except to read it. And all those who had believed were together. They had all things in common. Not communism, Holy Spiritism. Not socialism, Holy Spiritism. Holy Spiritism is always voluntary. Never the state takes control and seizes some, something from someone, gives to another. That's, that's the devil, what the devil does. And yet it's presented as if it, it, it's a Christian act for the state to seize wealth from the wealthy and give it to the... Listen, if you, if you, say, if you say it's not fair... Uh, that Bill Gates has billions of dollars and I've only got barely enough to, to, to live, I will say to you, who are you, God? How do you determine what, what is, is, is fair? God determines what's fair. Listen, life isn't fair. Life isn't fair, the way we think of it, but God's the only one who determines justice. And what is right? You're making yourself God when you say what's being said constantly today. They began selling their property and sharing with people. I think with the crisis that's coming, we're going to have to do this. I think we're going to have to share. I think we're going to have to take people in. I think it's going to be different in America. And day to day, they were continued with one mind. Not the same opinion about everything, but they loved Christ. They were in love with Jesus. You're in love with Jesus, I'm in love with Jesus. You're in love with the whole class in love with Jesus. Uh, we're one. We become one. Praising God. Praising God. Praising God. Praising God. And the Lord added to their number day by day. 
Well, that New Testament church was the example. So next time we'll look at uh, what uh, what is coming. Now I want to use the Old Testament because uh, God's going to be intervening more and more. I'm really looking forward to God. God's going to intervene in greater and mighty, more mighty power all the time, directly. Praise God. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Yeah, we're, we're Mike, put a note in your books. Dr. Neff will be here on January the 15th. It's not the first Sunday, but because the first Sunday is on New Year's Day and the way the church has got things set up right now, the 15th will be when he comes back and we'll get to February the time after that. Okay. Father, we just thank you and praise you for this day. We thank you, Lord, that you have supplied us with the time needed to do what Dr. Neff was led to do. We'll give you praise for that. Christ the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord has blessed you. He has kept you. Hallelujah. He has made His face to shine upon you and given you a grace. He has lifted His countenance upon you and brought you a peace passing understanding. He has blessed you and favored you. He has provided the grace sufficient for every need you have. And I bless you with health and wealth and well-being. Hallelujah. With creative ideas and, and, and inventive thought patterns all through this day, aligning themselves with the will of God for you. And we do this in the name of Jesus. And we do it with thanksgiving. All God's people said, Amen. 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 Thank you.